teach at the law school and along with Professor Neville Hode, co-direct the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice. Um, it is my pleasure with Professor Sharmila Rudrapa, who is the director of the South Asia Institute um, that is co-sponsoring this event, to welcome you to the second lecture in our fall 2020 colloquium, Inequality, Labor, and Human Rights, the Future of Work in the Age of Pandemic. Professor Prabha Koteswaran will present her paper, An Ode to Altruism, How Indian Courts Value Unpaid Domestic Work, and Professor Eric Encarnacion will respond. As many of you know, the Rappaport Center hosts a colloquium every fall on human rights and inequality. We have for the last, I think this is our fifth year. This year's colloquium though is also part of the build up for a new interdisciplinary and cross campus initiative we're really excited about on the future of work. Um, that initiative is generously supported by the Office of the Vice President for Research and we'll be holding a pop-up institute next summer entitled Beyond the Future of Work, New Paradigms for Addressing Ine Global Inequality. Um, and we're using this colloquium to begin to think in earnest together about these issues. Um, I should say we'll be having a town hall in November sometime, um, and you'll get an announcement about it if you registered for this, um, to talk about the pop-up institute. And you're all welcome to join us um, to think through what we might do um, leading up to the, what else we might do leading up to the summer. Um, the colloquium is also part of an interdisciplinary seminar that we teach at the law school each year. Um, I'm teaching it this year with Rappaport Center's new postdoctoral fellow, um, Michelle Khan, who's an historian of labor sociology. 12 of the participants in the room today are also in the seminar. And in preparation for the talk today, um, we read some of uh, Professor Koteswaran's other work and we discussed more generally what it means to do a critical distributional analysis in law. Um, basically, how do we pay special attention to the distributive effects of legal rules and often the rules that we don't normally think about or pay attention to. Um, so it's exciting that, um, as you'll hear in a moment, that Prabh is going to contribute to that um, that discussion as well. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to thank um, our assistant director, Sarah Eliason, for all of her work on coordinating and promoting the event, as well as our intern, Adeline Alvarez, who is unable to be here because of a class conflict, but who is represented by her beautiful poster um, that many of you all saw, and that I think, yes, is still up um, on the, on the uh, on the screen. So it is now my pleasure to introduce someone I consider a colleague, even though she teaches thousands of miles away, and that is maybe a silver lining um, in the Zoom world. Um, she's kind enough to join us very late in the evening um, uh, in London now. Um, Dr. Prabha Koteswaran is Professor of Law and Social Justice at King's College in London. Um, her main area of research and teaching is criminal law, including transnational criminal law. Although in today's paper, she's entering the area of private law, specifically torts. As you will witness today, she brings the lenses of postcolonial theory, feminist legal theory, and sociology of law um, to all of her work. She often engages in ethnography, which brings an incredible depth and richness to the work. She's author of numerous articles and the monograph, Dangerous Sex, Invisible Labor, Sex, Work, and the Law in India. And that's where the criminal fo law focus and labor law focus come together is in a lot of her work on sex work. Um, that was published by Princeton University Press and won the 2012 SLSA Hart Prize for Early Career Academics. She's also co-author of Governance Feminism, an introduction um, and she's a principal investigator of a five-year European Research Council consolidator grant on the laws of social reproduction. Dr. Eric Encarnacion is um, my colleague uh, here at Texas Law, but is just as far away in some, in some senses um, as Pravit is today, or maybe you're both just as close. Um, he's an assistant professor here at Texas Law. 
Um, in addition to being a lawyer, he holds a PhD in philosophy. He's already published several articles in law reviews, mostly focusing on the moral foundations of private law, um, especially contract and tort law. Um, I know he's writing a piece on remedies as well, which is why I thought he would be particularly appropriate for today's discussion. Greetings, uh, I'm Karen Ingle. I teach at the law school and along with Professor Neville Hode, co-direct the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice. Um, it is my pleasure with Professor Sharmila Rudrapa, who is the director of the South Asia Institute um, that is co-sponsoring this event, to welcome you to the second lecture in our fall 2020 colloquium, Inequality, Labor, and Human Rights, the Future of Work in the Age of Pandemic. Professor Prabha Koteswaran will present her paper, An Ode to Altruism, how Indian courts value unpaid domestic work, and Professor Eric Encarnacion will respond. As many of you know, the Rappaport Center hosts a colloquium every fall on human rights and inequality. We have for the last, I think this is our fifth year. This year's colloquium, though, is also part of the buildup for a new interdisciplinary and cross-campus initiative we're really excited about on the future of work. Um, that initiative is generously supported by the Office of the Vice President for Research and will be holding a pop-up institute next summer entitled Beyond the Future of Work, New Paradigms for Addressing in a Global Inequality. Um, and we're using this colloquium to begin to think in earnest together about these issues. Um, I should say we'll be having a town hall in November sometime um, and you'll get an announcement about it if you registered for this. Um, to talk about the Pop-Up Institute, and you're all welcome to join us um, to think through what we might do um, leading up to the, what else we might do leading up to the summer. Um, the colloquium is also part of an interdisciplinary seminar that we teach at the law school each year. Um, I'm teaching it this year with Rappaport Center's new postdoctoral fellow, um, Michelle Khan, who's an historian of labor sociology. 12 of the participants in the room today are also in the seminar. And in preparation for the talk today, um, we read some of uh, Professor Kotis Warren's other work and we discussed more generally what it means to do a critical distributional analysis in law. Um, basically, how do we pay special attention to the distributive effects of legal rules and often the rules that we don't normally think about or pay attention to. Um, so it's exciting that, um, as you'll hear in a moment, that Prabha is going to contribute to that, um, that discussion as well. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to thank um, our assistant director, Sarah Eliason, for all of her work on coordinating and promoting the event, as well as our intern, Adeline Alvarez, who is unable to be here because of a class conflict, but who is represented by her beautiful poster um, that many of you all saw and that I think, yes, is still up um, on, the, on, the, uh, on the screen. Um, we'd like you to have the best Zoom experience possible today. And so with that in mind, um, I have a few logistical items or suggestions. So we'll ask you to turn off your video and microphone during the presentations themselves. Um, and a trick if you don't already know it, once you've turned off your video, you can hover over three dots, and I'm not sure if it's on your name or someone else's name, so you can try them both until you get to the option to hide all non-video participants. Um, we recommend you do that as it makes it look a little bit more like a webinar, um, but you have total control over it. Um, during the question and answer sessions, we'll ask all the students in the seminar and anyone else um, who would like, so ideally everyone, to turn your cameras back on. Um, to avoid distraction, we ask you to hold your questions until our speakers are done. And the way that we'll do the questions is we'll uh, use the chat um, for people to share questions directly um, and uh, ask you to send them to everyone. Um, we're, you can post the questions and we'll read them out, but we're also very, very happy for you to ask the question yourself. And if you wanna do that, just type in RTS request to speak and just give us a hint about the 
the topic of the question so we can try to, to group them. Um, and uh, Michelle and I will ask the questions, we'll alternate asking the questions afterward. Um, if you are in the YouTube session today, uh, you won't be able to speak, but you should feel free to type in your questions. Um, and Jacob Bloss, one of our interns, um, will copy them into the chat room. So it is now my pleasure to introduce someone I consider a colleague, even though she teaches thousands of miles away, and that is maybe a silver lining um, in the Zoom world. Um, she's kind enough to join us very late in the evening um, uh, in London now. Um, Dr. Prabha Kutuswaran is Professor of Law and Social Justice at King's College in London. Um, her main area of research and teaching is criminal law, including transnational criminal law, although in today's paper she's entering the area of private law, specifically torts. As you will witness today, she brings the lenses of postcolonial theory, feminist legal theory, and sociology of law um, to all of her work. She often engages in ethnography, which brings an incredible depth and richness to the work. She's author of numerous articles and the monograph, Dangerous Sex, Invisible Labor, Sex, Work, and the Law in India. And that's where the criminal fo law focus and labor law focus come together is in a lot of her work on sex work. Um, that was published by Princeton University Press and won the 2012 SLSA Hart Prize for Early Career Academics. She's also co-author of Governance Feminism, an introduction, um, and she's a principal investigator of a five-year European Research Council consolidator grant on the laws of social reproduction. Dr. Eric Encarnacion is um, my colleague uh, here at Texas Law, but is just as far away in some, in some senses um, as Pravit is today, or maybe you're both just as close. Um, he's an assistant professor here at Texas Law. Um, in addition to being a lawyer, he holds a PhD in philosophy. He's already published several articles in law reviews, mostly focusing on the moral foundations of private law, um, especially contract and tort law. Um, I know he's writing a piece on remedies as well, which is why I thought he would be particularly appropriate for today's discussion. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Prabhaka Tuswaran. Wonderful. Uh, thank you to Professor Zengel and Rudrapa for this very kind invitation to present my work uh, with all of you today. Um, it is uh, obviously a rare privilege for colleagues and law students to actually engage so deeply with one's work. So I'm really grateful for that. Uh, not only have they read uh, some of my previous work on sex work in India, but have also engaged with uh, a paper that I'm about to present now, which is in a new area uh, for me personally of private law thinking. And so I'm very grateful to uh, sound you all on some of my ideas here today. Uh, I also want to thank in advance Eric, as well as the students um, who kindly have written reaction papers to my paper, uh, which have been, uh, the, the reaction papers in particular have been very rich and thought provoking. And I also look forward to Eric's comments uh, on my paper. So, um, so I just wanted to mention to the students that I will try and weave in um, my um, comments and uh, responses to their reaction papers as and when I can, but please do feel free to uh, post the questions uh, during the discussion in case I've missed um, some of your uh, queries. So what I want to do today is just situate, before I start my paper, I just want to situate this uh, in light of a larger project that Karen already mentioned, which is on the laws of social reproduction. So in this particular uh, large, uh, uh, research project uh, on which I have a few postdocs working with me. What I'm trying to do is uh, attempt a cross-sectoral uh, analysis and comparison of five sectors of women's work in India today. And this includes sex work, it includes erotic dancing, it includes commercial surrogacy, uh, paid domestic work, and unpaid domestic work. So as you can see, I'm trying to bridge the marriage market continuum, so to speak, uh, in looking at these five sectors, uh, 
And my intuition is that actually there, is, there are more similarities between these sectors of women's reproductive labor than meet the eye. So I'm really keen to tease out uh, some of these similarities, but also key differences between the sectors. And in particular, I'm trying to articulate a theory, a legal theory of reproductive labor, uh, which maps out the default legal regimes that regulate each of these sectors of women's labor. So for example, sex work is governed by criminal law, erotic dancing largely by licensing law, uh, commercial surrogacy by contract law, uh, paid domestic work by labor law and contract law, and then finally, unpaid domestic work. Um, and here I'm looking at tort law, but we'll soon also look at family law as a site for regulation of unpaid work. So what I'm particularly interested in is the contingent nature of the legal categorization of these forms of labor. Um, and I want to explore in a legal realist and critical legal vein, what other rules could be invoked to regulate these sectors and whether these might in fact translate into better economic outcomes for women in these sectors. Um, now, having just set out uh, the project, the larger project in itself, um, coming to today's paper, which is focused particularly on unpaid domestic work, I just want to say a little bit about the feminist landscape in thinking about reproductive labor. So of course, I draw uh, heavily on the idea of social reproduction, and social reproduction theory, which are Marxist, socialist, and materialist feminist terms. Uh, but I also acknowledge that there are equally influential feminist strands of thinking about reproductive labor, although they may not be framed uh, explicitly in terms of labor. So of course, we have uh, uh, liberal feminists who have also been uh, talking about unpaid work uh, for a while and how to balance it uh, in relation to paid work for the market. Uh, there's, of course, also cultures, cultural feminist strains of uh, thinking about um, uh, uh, unpaid work, uh, which, I, uh, which I'm not uh, focused on in this paper. And then, of course, uh, we are more familiar with the radical feminist uh, view of the law uh, and of women's labor, which they often categorize as violence against women. So a lot of my previous work has been aimed at dislodging this characterization of women's sexual labor as sexual violence. Um, and in today's paper, I want to look more particularly at uh, an area that I think pretty much all feminists agree is a form of reproductive labor, which is the labor of housewives. So um, as we know, about 150,000 men, women, and children uh, die every year in road accidents in India. Uh, leading, a just, leading, to, leading a judge um, of the Madras High Court to term Indian roads as death traps of our population. And several of these uh, victims are housewives. So in this paper, I ask how their husbands and children petition the courts for compensation and the grounds on which courts accept, reject, or modify their um, uh, their claims for compensation. And I ask in particular how a particular area of private law, namely tort law or the law of personal injury recognizes this unpaid labor of housewives. And I look at the architecture of private law that allows for this kind of recognition. And I ask how we can understand the role of tort law in particular in redistributing resources between men and women on the one hand, but also amongst women themselves. And I want to ask whether tort law holds the potential for affecting egalitarian outcomes, and if so, under what circumstances, and ultimately whether legal analysis can inform the larger debates amongst feminists on social reproduction, or whether the law simply mirrors, uh, even reproduce, reproduces inequitous uh, social realities. Now to explore these questions in some more detail, I elaborate on a subset of roughly 200 cases decided by Indian appellate courts between 1968 and 2019 on the death of housewives to demonstrate how their labor uh, was valued by the courts under the Motor Vehicles Act of 1988. Now, tort law is a robust area of feminist legal scholarship. And in the paper, I speak uh, a little bit to uh, how feminist legal scholars have critiqued uh, tort law and the way it deals with gendered subjects. Uh, 
Now, in addition to looking at the effects of tort law on women themselves, feminist legal scholars have also challenged the logic of legal reasoning, uh, identifying it as inherently masculinist. Now, specifically, the loss of women's unpaid care and domestic work uh, is compensated under the non-pecuniary heading of the loss of consortium under tort law. And this has been the subject of research by feminist legal scholars. Now, Lucinda Finley has traced the claim for loss of consortium to the husband's historical right of ownership over his wife and her household and sexual services to him. And this explained the lack of a corresponding claim, she claims, under tort law, which could be made by wives for the loss of consortium when their husbands died, until this was repudiated in the US as late as the 1950s. Meanwhile, we find that paltry amounts were offered under this heading of loss of consortium upon the death of a housewife in the form of compensation. So Catherine Silbo has written of how valuing domestic labor as an element of love and affection under the heading of loss of consortium converted in her terms, labor into love. And this reflects, as Lucinda Finley argues, the tort system's prioritization of men's wage earning capacity and the non-recognition of women's unpaid domestic um, and care work as work. And she observes that this legal measure automatically devalues women whose earning capacity has been depressed by society's denial of financial reward for household services rendered within one's own family. Now, social scientists further have documented how both simulated juries and juries in real life routinely award higher compensation for dependents of male victims than female victims. And this is because jurors were less likely to consider financial loss to the surviving spouse when the surviving spouse was male. Furthermore, due to longstanding discrimination in the workplace and the resultant wage gap, um, we find that when lost wages are the focus of the damages, then of course, uh, the compensation for female um, uh, loss of wages tended to be uh, much lower than for men. So for all practical purposes, what we find is that the driving principle behind tort law uh, is that of restoring individuals to a pre-incident scenario, and that therefore it renders tort law quite status coerced, although it actually appears to be neutral and non-redistributive. Now, I argue that actually examining uh, the minutiae of uh, rules of damages under tort law is beneficial for a few reasons for feminists. Uh, it has, I argue, both normative and methodological payoffs. So normatively speaking, quantification, although it's uh, not particularly well studied within tort law itself by academics, uh, quantification goes actually to the very heart of feminist debates on unpaid domestic and care work, making visible the feasibility of recognition by the state, a task that the legal system already manages to do in the realm of tort law. Now, methodologically speaking, the study of tort law is also usefully contrasted with the efforts of feminists in other disciplines, uh, say feminist economists who are particularly influential in the South Asian context, who through methods at their disposal, for example, surveys, seek to quantify the multitude of tasks that housewives actually engage in. Now, unlike in the case of national surveys, which are commissioned by the government, where respondents may often had low motivation in sharing the exact nature of the work that they engage in, or they simply dismiss their own labor as valuable work. Uh, what we find is that if you look at the tort laws, that family members who bring claims on behalf of deceased housewives are actually highly motivated to itemize the full range of work that housewives actually do. And so examining the archive of the law throws light on key concepts that feminists and social theorists have long worked with in attempting to have women's unpaid domestic and care work recognized. Um, now in the paper, I speak a little bit about the post-colonial context of India and uh, the reforms to tort law when compared to uh, you know, the tort law developments in England and Wales, for example. Um, so under common law, uh, compensation was typically awarded only when liability was based on fault. And uh, the Indian legal system, to the extent that it inherited uh, English common law principles, uh, 
was similarly based on a fault-based principle for awarding compensation. Um, but what happens is that in the 1970s and 80s, we find that interpretations of the Motor Vehicles Act were imbued with constitutional values, uh, particularly um, the directive principles of state policy, which require that the state, within the limits of its economic capacity and development, make effective provision for securing the right to public assistance in cases of unemployment, sickness, and disablement, and in other cases of undeserved want. So we find that the socialist disposition of the Indian state and its commitment to redistribution were repeatedly mentioned by judges and lawmakers when they looked at tort law. Um, and they were particularly concerned because of the poor and largely illiterate population which struggled to enforce the Motor Vehicles Act for adequate and timely compensation. So um, here we have a quote from uh, the famous Justice Vyar Krishnayar, where he's talking about how, uh, in fact, although uh, Indian law continued to rely on the English common law principle of fault-based liability, that in fact, uh, parliament should bring about change um, in the interests of social justice. And so in the paper, I talk about the you know, several uh, law commission reports that were published on the Motor Vehicles Act. And what is key for us is uh, to recognize that by uh, 1988, we have a new Motor Vehicles Act, which replaced the 1939 law. And um, in this 1988 law, uh, there is for the first time uh, uh, several grounds of no fault liability. Um, where both, you know, the victim uh, dies or is permanently disabled. In addition, in 1994, there was another amendment to the Motor Vehicles Act, which essentially said that if you have a deceased person um, who earned less than 40,000 rupees a year, uh, then there would be a special statutory uh, uh, code uh, built into the Motor Vehicles Act, which would award compensation on a no-fault liability basis. So the idea was that uh, dispensation of compensation under this scheme would be quick and efficient and uh, insurance companies could no longer detain poorer victims for years in protracted litigation. So in fact, we have the Supreme Court in a 2002 case um, talk about uh, this section 163A as a social security scheme uh, for all practical purposes. Now, within um, Section 163A uh, is uh, a schedule to the Motor Vehicles Act. And we find that in Clause 6 of the second schedule, a provision uh, whereby we are told that where a person does not have an income prior to the accident, then a notional income would be attributed by the statute. So we find that in the case of non-earning persons, this was fixed by parliament at 15,000 rupees a year, which is a very paltry amount. It's about you know, 1,200 rupees a month. Um, and at current exchange rates, I would say it's about you know, 10 to $12 a month. Um, this clause six of the second schedule also said that if you have a spouse uh, who's deceased, then their income would be fixed at one third the income of the earning or surviving spouse. So we, we see that already there is um, inbuilt discrimination here that women would have uh, suffered from under the Motor Vehicles Act. Now I'll come back to this um, as I discuss the case law under this act, but I just want to quickly, uh, for those of you who, may, who are not lawyers, I just want to say that there are two categories of damages awarded under tort law. Uh, one is the category of pecuniary or economic losses. This includes the loss of income, uh, the loss of services to family, which I'll be talking about a little bit more, uh, medical expenses and funeral expenses. And then you also have non-pecuniary losses, which include pain and suffering, uh, pain and shock, love and affection, loss of fetus, shock and agony, and so on. And importantly, loss of consortium. So typically you find that non-pecuniary losses are a fixed amount that courts uh, will offer award, say for loss of consortium. Whereas if you look at pecuniary or economic losses, there is the potential to assign a certain uh, value um, to, you know, to, the, to the deceased life, which can then be replicated for the lifespan of the, of the deceased person. So, um, the process through which courts 
uh, arrived at the compensation was as follows. So they would typically um, estimate what is called the multiplicand. Uh, so it would typically be based on loss of earnings or loss of income of the deceased. And then, you know, and in the case of someone who's not earning, then it would be the notional income, which we see um, in the statute itself. And from this multiplicand, there would typically be a deduction of one third of the income towards expenses for the upkeep of the deceased, had the deceased been alive. And then the courts would identify a suitable multiplier based on the victim's age at the time of the accident. So the lower the age of the victim, the higher the multiplier, and therefore higher uh, the level of compensation, and higher the age of the victim, the lower the multiplier. So we find that um, for claims under section 163A, the second schedule helpfully had a table which you know, identified multiplicands, multipliers, and the total amount. It was meant to assist the courts in arriving at compensation. Now, in addition to that, you could add general damages, which was again listed under the second schedule. So this is the, the sort of technical part um, of the Motor Vehicles Act, and I'll, I'll you know, uh, stop there in terms of just, you know, laying out the law. Now, now I'll move on to the section of the paper, which talks about the trajectory for the recognition of unpaid domestic and care work. Now, the most significant element of compensation for a deceased person is usually his or her loss of income. And this is relatively straightforward in the case of an employed worker who is in the formal sector, where there is proof of income. For housewives, however, insurance companies often disputed awards for pecuniary losses claiming that they had no income, uh, thus privileging paid work outside the home. Uh, at other times, they would often say that, you know, in fact, her dependence didn't depend on her income, even if she had income. So therefore, there should be no compensation. So in order to recognize the value of housewives' reproductive labor, courts had to come up with a new heading for pecuniary compensation based on loss of services to family. And then they found novel methods to measure this loss. And this was complicated by the fact that actually the category of housewives was somewhat unstable, if not illusory. So um, here is, you know, a sort of passing out of the case law um, that I found, you know, if, uh, and the search term that I looked for was housewife. And so we find that you can categorize the labor of housewives along these four um, axes. So you have women who only perform reproductive labor for their family. You have women who are performing reproductive labor for their family and paid non-reproductive work for the market outside the home. So you see a few examples there, uh, you know, cultivation, working with an NGO and so on. And then you have women performing reproductive labor for their family and paid reproductive work outside the home. So for example, uh, they would work in several houses as a domestic worker or as school teachers and so on. And then finally, you have the category of women performing reproductive labor for their own family, but they also perform paid productive work within the home. So this was just various forms of outsourcing, you know, things like uh, stitching garments for a factory, embroidery, tailoring, and so on. So, um, and I, I focus on all of these categories of labor uh, in my analysis. So we find that the category of the loss of services to family was first considered by the courts in the 1960s. So you have the Bombay High Court in a 1968 case held that a husband was entitled to compensation representing the money value for the services which his wife rendered and for which he now had to engage servants. And this principle was reiterated in subsequent cases. In 1982, the Punjab and Haryana High Court held that the expense for loss of services to the family would be calculated by estimating the replacement cost for a maid and by factoring in the cost for her lodging and boarding, as well as increases in her salary over the years. So you have another similar case in 1985 in Sunny Chug, where the Punjab and Haryana High Court again referred to the English treatise Kemp and Kemp on damages to identify the various heads under which replacement costs could be awarded on the death of a housewife. In the 1986 case of Kehar Singh Ganda, for example, the um, court held that compensation could be assessed for deceased earnings and gratuitous services in the upkeep of household. Now, subsequently, in a 1988 case, um, the Andhra Pradesh High Court held that the term services had to be construed broadly. 
and that the loss of services to family was larger than, than, the, than just the replacement cost of a maid or a cook, as no substitute could be as economical as a housewife. And the court argued that to begin with, for a replacement, the family would have to incur accommodation costs, and sometimes the husband may have to leave his job if, there, if he had a sickly child, um, in which case the loss of his income would have to be factored in. Further, that the loss of services to family could not be minimized simply because the unpaid work was being undertaken by a close female relative, such as a grandmother. And here, uh, the loss of love and affection, the court argued, had to be part of the loss of services and that courts must construe services broadly on par with English law. And the case that the court relied on was this 1977 case of Regan B. Williamson. And you know, I've just uh, shared some sentences uh, from Justice um, um, Watkins uh, in this case, where he talks about how services had to be construed broadly. And so we find that um, the Andhra Pradesh High Court relying on this case then holds that in fact, um, you know, uh, Indian housewives uh, should be recognized on par with their English counterparts, and therefore uh, we should construe services broadly. So what we have here is that this 1988 case lays the foundation for Indian courts recognition of housewives unpaid domestic and care work under tort law. So earlier, her reproductive labor would have been subsumed under the limited pecuniary category of loss of services to family, to which then compensation for loss of love and affection would be added. But loss of love and affection was then part of the non-pecuniary category of loss of consortium. And both of these headings attracted a fixed and limited sum of compensation. Um, whereas now what the Indian courts did was to expand the pecuniary category of loss of services to family by including under it the non-pecuniary category of um, loss of love and affection. So they appreciated more fully the housewife services to go beyond unpaid domestic work for which you could have replacement costs, um, but then to also include unpaid domestic and care work. So they increased the quantum of compensation under this heading of loss of services to family and then started multiplying it for the housewife's reproductive lifespan to result in a much higher amount. So the next leap uh, in the jurisprudence comes about in 2009 uh, in, a, in a decidedly uh, feminist judgment where Justices uh, Prabhashri Devan and T.S. Shivagnanam of the Madras High Court um, deepened this conceptual foundation for the recognition of unpaid uh, domestic and care work. Uh, and they argue that after all, uh, the home is the conceptual, sorry, the home is the basic unit on which our civilized uh, society rests. And for the first time, you find that the court uh, begins to look to international law for uh, support. And in particular, the court in this case looked to uh, a CEDAW general recommendation, which requires states to encourage and support research to evaluate the unremunerated domestic activities of women and quantify that and include that within the gross national project uh, product. Um, and we find that Justice Sri Devan uses for the first time a gender neutral term of homemaker. And she also offers a rather middle class understanding of social reproduction. And she talks about managing budgets. Uh, she talks about coordinating activities, balancing accounts, helping children with education, uh, nursing care, managing health at home and so on. And then she talks about uh, a partnership method for assessing compensation and argues that Indian uh, courts and parliament need a more sophisticated way of recognizing women's labor within the home, both under constitutional law as well as family law. And so uh, she has later in interviews uh, spoken about how she had an eye to the Supreme Court where she thought her, her judgment would actually be uh, challenged. Um, and therefore she had you know, couched her decision in feminist terms. Now, um, soon enough, this case, um, not this particular case, but another case involving uh, a deceased housewife came up before the Supreme Court in 2010. And here we have the Supreme Court relying, you know, uh, undertaking a, a review of all the cases until now, but also relying on the uh, Chennai High Court decision of 2009 to uh, issue a significant judgment, citing a range of international advocacy and academic materials, 
um, to argue that in fact the labor of Indian housewives must be adequately recognized and remunerated. Um, so uh, there's a sense in which the Supreme Court is uh, recognizes that the housewife did much more than the market could ever recognize. And that although domestic work was more easily quantifiable and was indeed fungible because you could hire a housekeeper or a domestic worker, um, the affective labors of the housewife uh, performed day and night could not be. And that could not be recognized adequately by the market. And so the Supreme Court disagreed with the Delhi High Court, for instance, which had in the past used the minimum wages of a skilled worker as the, the baseline for determining compensation due to a housewife. And what is actually quite remarkable about this judgment is an opinion uh, issued by Justice Ashok uh, Kumar Ganguly, who actually uh, you know, problematized Clause 6, which I'd earlier referred to, uh, and uh, spoke at length about how discriminatory it was against housewives and how it had no rational basis. But in this particular case, this clause was not challenged, so he could not strike it down. Um, and then he castigated census authorities for listing homemakers alongside sex workers and beggars and prisoners who are not considered to be productive. Um, and also hinted at legal consequences for this discriminatory action uh, by public authority. Um, and fascinatingly, Justice Ganguly cited feminist economists, uh, Indian feminist economists actually, in adopting an expansive concept of work to include subsistence agriculture and expenditure uh, saving activity, which feminist e economists have argued for a long time to be included uh, within the uh, SNA boundary, the system of national accounts, uh, you know, production boundary. Um, he also talked about concepts such as depletion, which uh, Shirin Rai has talked about, where if you don't uh, recognize uh, and support the unpaid work that women do, it often results in depletion um, of their, uh, their health, uh, physical and mental health. Um, he also highlighted the opportunity cost of unpaid work as the reason for women's poverty uh, because they were not able to undertake paid work in the market. He also hauled up the Indian government for not satisfying its international law obligations under CEDAW and underlined the need to start using time use surveys to evaluate unpaid work. So he ultimately called for amending the Motor Vehicles Act and also bring about changes in, in family law. Now, on the face of it, this decision uh, was a significant pronouncement, both in material but also symbolic terms for the recognition of women's unpaid work. And since then, it has sparked the development of a robust jurisprudence on women's unpaid work. So prior to 2010, you know, over uh, two, three decades, you find about 60 cases dealing with housewives. But since 2010 alone, you see a, a flurry of cases dealing with housewives. And, you know, I've looked, I mean, uh, certainly there are 200 cases just since 2010, uh, and 100 of them cite uh, the Agarwal case. Um, and interestingly, the case has also been followed in non-motor vehicle cases. So, for example, where a woman, a housewife dies uh, in a medical negligence case, for example. And its rhetoric on altruism has gained popularity, and many judges have used it as, um, you know, a way of putting the stamp of social justice on their decisions. So, for example, uh, here is a case from 2016 where the Chhattisgarh High Court talked about how the mother reproduced the cultural fabric of Indian society. Um, in 2020, a rather enthusiastic uh, Justice Subramaniam of the Madras High Court, and this was widely reported quite recently in the Indian media, uh, went on to laud the role of women as mothers in building the nation. Um, and we find that, you know, just like in Arun Kumar Agarwal, courts continue to find clause six of the second schedule to be quite problematic. And so, for example, in this 2019 case, we find the Madras High Court strongly objecting to Clause 6 and claiming that, you know, a, a, how, a homemaker uh, and her unpaid work is on par with paid work outside of the household. And so, um, and also uh, Justice Kirba Karan in this particular decision noted the growing gender equality at the workplace with women sometimes earning more than their husbands in the Indian context and arguing that therefore it was not acceptable to peg one spouse's income to another's. Um, so he went so far as to say that if this case had been a writ petition, he would have struck down clause six. Now, 
so you know so there's there are several cases where you know housewives are killed but um, and the the problem with the law is that actually it's deeply irrational so this is something i talk about in the paper so on the face of it although all of these quotes post 1994 should really only be using the second schedule they actually find a range of methods for measuring losses so some of them look to the replacement cost, as I've already mentioned, and this was certainly true of the earlier cases. Then you find quotes which were looking to the opportunity cost um, you know, of a woman's decision to work at home. Uh, they would often consider minimum wage tables for skilled workers, for unskilled workers. Uh, they would peg compensation levels to educational qualifications of the woman, and then they would adjust it for age and you know, whether uh, she had children or not. Uh, similarly, there was the partnership principle that I've already talked about. Um, and then also courts would often follow case law. Uh, and so they, they in particular used the Lata Vadva case, uh, which was not a motor vehicles case. Um, it was actually a negligence case um, where the Supreme Court had to come up with a figure for what they thought was um, the value of a woman's uh, housewife's work. And the reason I mentioned Lata Vadva is because the amount uh, arrived uh, at in that case was actually much higher than the second schedule. So it was, you know, almost double the amount that the second schedule allowed for. And therefore, courts were very opportunistic in which of these methods they used because they clearly thought that the second schedule uh, was, you know, not adjusted for inflation and that it was simply outdated. So you find that courts were just, you know, they had a whole range of, uh, uh, you know, monthly figures that they'd come up with. Um, and, you know, even the second schedule figures, they would, you know, often simply alter because they simply thought it wasn't fair that the compensation was so low uh, if one were to go with the Motor Vehicles Act. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of housewives also did paid work outside of the home or within the home, you know, um, uh, alongside performing unpaid work for their families. So what we find is that a lot of this paid work was an informal economy. And here there was no discernible employment relationship or proof of income. So in effect, you find an informality penalty, uh, you know, considering that 92% of India's working population is in the informal economy, this had serious consequences for women, but particularly for housewives. Um, so insurance companies would often deny claims, um, because there was no proof of income and courts would often agree with them. But post 2010, following Arun Kumar Agarwal, courts became more lenient. They began to recognize uh, housewives work in the informal economy. Uh, so for example, in Hasnath Yadav, uh, the Uttar Pradesh High Court simply said, well, if there was no evidence of income, you'd simply have to take judicial notice of the skills uh, that the women had. Similarly, um, so for example, in another case, uh, the Gujarat High Court, uh, no, actually the Supreme Court held that, uh, just to give you an example of the kind of work, you know, so uh, these, uh, the women, the woman who died was from uh, the Kutch district where, you know, it's a drought prone area and women often did, uh, you know, embroidery. So the extended family, the women in the extended family did embroidery. And so when she died, the court simply said that uh, her monthly income would be the same as what her sister-in-law earned from doing embroidery, for example. So we find that they redress this informality penalty. Similarly, you find that you know, earlier, there was no compensation for future prospects in employment uh, if one did not have a permanent job. So if one uh, worked in the informal economy or was self-employed, um, you know, there, was, there was no compensation for uh, loss of future prospects in employment. And this again affected women and disproportionately at that because they often work in the informal economy, but even more so housewives because uh, future prospects were not considered for the housewife, but were, were considered for her replacement, um, you know, say a, a housekeeper or a domestic worker. Um, finally, we find that, uh, you know, the compensation for the work of housewives reduced with their age. Uh, because they, the courts assumed that, in fact, they would be performing uh, less uh, childcare as they got older. Now, uh, what we find here is that um, the, the Supreme Court upheld this additional future prospects 
um, in cases where the deceased was self-employed or working in the informal sector, and gradually it was extended to housewives as well. Um, and then, of course, there are lots of uh, other means through which courts would increase the compensation for women's unpaid work. So for example, they reduced deductions for living expenses, and they were often creative about, about this. They would say, well, there's no difference uh, whether you know, she died in an accident or she died naturally. So in fact, we should not deduct any expenses from the compensation due to her dependents. Or they would say, well, her income was only notional. You know, it wasn't in fact an income, so therefore we should not deduct uh, expenses. Um, similarly, they would enhance compensation under literally every head, um, whether pecuniary or non-pecuniary. And so I won't go into detail here, except to note that, you know, even as recently as 1995, uh, compensation for the loss of fetus was not allowed. But by 2013, the Madras High Court invokes Arun Kumar Agarwal to actually uh, offer a, a substantial compensation of two and a half lakhs for the loss of fetus. So recognizing again, women's reproductive labor. So, um, so what I want to do here is, uh, you know, say a little bit about the distributional analysis. So for all practical purposes, what we find here is um, uh, wages for housework rule. And here, you know, I use this in a very loose sense because the feminists who argued for wages for housework actually um, wanted to put a price on wages uh, on housework in order to refuse housework rather than in fact want, you know, ask for a wage. So I use this very loosely that, you know, this tort law rule brought about by the Indian courts, um, you can call it loosely uh, wages for housework rule. Um, and you find that, you know, courts, um, you know, compete with each other to actually uh, embrace this, this uh, cause of wages for housework. So for example, even where dependents didn't ask for, you know, increased compensation, sometimes the Supreme Court would simply use its uh, extraordinary jurisdiction under Article 142 to triple the compensation, for example, in one case. So, so what I want to do here is, um, you know, on the face of it, this seems like a it seems like a feminist victory, although there are, you know, it's deeply problematic for for various reasons. And I've, you know, teased out some of these uh, decisions, you know, where uh, women seem to be valorized for, you know, as nation builders or as, you know. Um, uh, those who perform the work of cultural reproduction. Um, so what would a distributional analysis of this rule change look like? And here I, I refer to Janet Halley's um, uh, guidance on how we might do this kind of distributional analysis. She tells us to suspend our moral lenses and to actually pass out the various actors in any given setting. Um, rather than focus on the injury or the discrimination, she says, you know, look at the surplus in a certain setting, who's in fact producing the surplus and who's benefiting from it. Um, then she talks about how actually almost all actors have choices, but that all their choices are constrained and that we should always uh, expect that, you know, rules will not be enforced or that, you know, legal entitlements are malleable or that there could also be unintended consequences. Um, and similarly, I draw on Atashi Kerinpas, uh, who's a tort law scholar, uh, where he performs, you know, tr tries to forge a third path in contrast to the law and economics analysis of uh, tort law rules in the US context and the corrective justice approach uh, in the UK context, um, you know, as being too limiting. Instead, he calls for an egalitarian uh, understanding of. Um, you know, the effects of tort law uh, rule changes. And so again, I won't go into great detail here, except to say that he recognizes that a rule can have potentially conflicting distributive effects on the same person. Uh, so therefore we should think about the rules effects on different members within each group of, um, you know, plaintiffs and defendants, as well as on third parties. Uh, we should not prioritize promoting the lot of the worst of you know, as a starting point, and that redistribution is a messy affair, and it, it may not always make everyone happy all the time. So I think um, uh, one of the, uh, so in, in the paper, I tried to map out the full range of actors. Again, I won't go into great detail here, except to say that, um, you know, if you look at the intergroup uh, distribution, uh, in this case, you find that uh, the plaintiffs, whether they're rich or poor housewives, form one group. 
And then you have the insurance companies who are the defendants often. And we find that in fact, if you look at it from an intergroup uh, perspective uh, for distribution, we find that actually housewives benefit in relation to the insurance companies. But once you start looking at the intergroup uh, distributional effects, um, you, you find a rather different um, uh, analysis. So Karen Pass, for example, talks about how um, tort law rules can sometimes have contradictory effects even on the same person. So a protectionist rule uh, can confer a benefit on a, a protected person, but it can often come at the cost of symbolic and long lasting effects. And I think here, this is well illustrated when we consider that altruism is the basis of Indian courts recognition of unpaid work. So uh, for example, in a 1997 case, we find uh, evidence of this where a single woman uh, uh, dies and the court actually awards um, very limited compensation, only for, applies a multiplier of five, which is for five years uh, to her parents because they argue that she would have anyway been married in five years. That, so therefore there's a sense in which her reproductive labors were anticipated to contribute to uh, you know, uh, uh, her marital family in the future a family that she would have set up with her husband, and that becomes the reason for reducing her compensation. Uh, similarly, in another case in 2017, you find both the deceased, so this was a case of a newly married housewife where both her parents and her in-laws went to court, uh, arguing that they should be the ones getting the compensation. Um, and here the high court actually reverses the decision of the tribunal, and the tribunal had awarded compensation to the parents, but the, the high court here, the Punjab and Haryana High Court argues that, you know, uh, that the tribunal was mistaken in drawing on, you know, the jurisprudence of Southern Indian uh, appellate courts that, in fact, in South India, you know, it's a matriarchal system, whereas in the North, uh, they were patriarchal and that therefore, you know, really the, the beneficiaries in this case uh, should be her in-laws. So you already see how, uh, you know, the distributive effects are quite unsatisfactory. Um, so, so what we find is that there's a very clear validation of the woman's role in sustaining, you know, the heteropatriarchal institution of marriage. So, um, and this is obviously deeply problematic. Um, uh, but I, I, what I argue is that despite this reinforcement of uh, problematic cultural expectations, uh, the recognition of unpaid work in material and symbolic terms is preferable to a situation where courts use altruism as an excuse to deny recognition of the labor of housewives and deny compensation to the dependents of the housewife. Um, so as Karen Pa says, where you know the lot of the where the the victims might be very needy, this might in fact be uh, beneficial. Um, and in fact, uh, Justice Prabhashri Devan used precisely this argument when she was interviewed once, and you know she said that this was a strategic choice that she had made um, in winning recognition for women's labor. Um, so. Of course, one could argue that, um, you know, is this, you know, who's really benefiting from this wages for housework jurisprudence? Uh, does it really benefit housewives or is it simply a subsidy to capital? Um, and what I try to show in the paper is that actually, um, although compensation often was awarded to the dependents of housewives, sometimes housewives were also permanently disabled and their unpaid work was recognized just as the unpaid work of deceased housewives was. So the compensation would actually benefit the women themselves. Uh, further, this wages for housework jurisprudence was used to increase compensation for dependents of a diseased man, uh, to take judicial notice of increases to the incomes of self-employed persons in the informal economy, and for assessing compensation upon the death of a single woman. Also, courts often spoke of an egalitarian model of companionate marriage, which I've spoken about. Um, but if we now look at the you know, uh, dis intra-group distributional effects, um, we find that courts often distinguish the level of payment depending on whether the woman was a mother or not, depending on the number of child she had, how old they were, uh, educational status, um, and her age. And, you know, even apparently feminist judges like Justice Gita Mittal of the Delhi High Court, who's very well known for other progressive judgments, held that, you know, the amount of compensation under, you know, the Motor Vehicles Act um, should go down, you know, it should go up up to a certain age, but then go down from the age of uh, 50, and then it should uh, go to nil by the age of 
65 because it was simply presumed that women didn't have any reproductive labor by that point. Um, we also find that you know, courts had uh, biases which played out along class and educational lines. Already we see the, the expansion of the category of unpaid work from you know, domestic work to care work has a class bias. Um, uh, and then you also find uh, you know, discrimination on the basis of educational um, achievements, for example, which uh, Justice Mittal also argued for. She said, you have to set the wage level at the educational achievement of a housewife. So this again is a proxy for class status. So um, I just want to conclude by saying that, you know, it's clear that tort law can have significant redistributive effects. And this is something that has been acknowledged by courts uh, in India. Uh, and that, um, you know, the, the recognition of women's unpaid work has also come at some serious cost. Um, and um, so I just want to say quickly that um, the law has now changed, you know, so the Motor Vehicles Act was amended in 2019, and now a mandatory payment of five lakhs has to be paid uh, in the case of death on a no-fault liability basis. So it doesn't matter, um, you know, what the age, gender, occupation, or marital status of the disease is. There's just a fixed amount that is to be paid. But I still think that uh, this jurisprudence, the wages for housework jurisprudence, can be productively deployed outside of tort law. Um, so one could ask, um, you know, if courts quantify women's unpaid work upon death, why can't they do this, you know, when they're alive? Uh, and whether this could trigger developments in constitutional law and family law in other areas of private law. At the very least, it could be used to direct census authorities to, you know, reimagine the production boundary and to assess women's labor in a more accurate manner. And I think this will have knock-on effects on uh, you know, the perennial debates around women's declining female labor force participation rates in India. Uh, it can also be used to activate uh, an Article 23 prohibition of unfree labor. Uh, and I think it also has, um, you know, close relationship uh, with more universal redistributive measures such as universal basic income. So, for example, Kathy Weeks has tried to channel the wages for housework campaign of the 1970s into a demand uh, or rather as a provocation uh, for a demand for universal basic income. So I just want to conclude by saying that, you know, um, uh, I, I don't, I mean, so although we could be quite critical about the way that uh, the courts have actually uh, recognized uh, certain forms of unpaid care in domestic work, I don't want to simply, uh, you know, discern the hand of, of uh, you know, capitalism here, you know, that simply everything that the courts are simply uh, promoting a subsidy to capitalism uh, or they are effectuating an advance and transfer from insurance companies to men and children who are dependents of the housewives rather than women themselves, for example. Neither do I want to simply read these judicial pronouncements as reiterating the logic of you know, gendered familialism, which is glossed over, as we've seen with cultural and nationalist pride. Um, and you know, instead, um, you know, what I want to simply argue is that, um, you know, the law can be a rather irrational field. And, you know, although I presented a rather uh, seamless um, account of how courts recognize women's labor, in fact, if you look at the, the judgments, it's actually very hard to find, uh, you know, this clear cut picture. Uh, in fact, it's incredibly incoherent. Uh, and I think even judges and lawyers would be very confused about exactly what the law is. Um, in this area, and I think that simply highlights the sheer contingency of, uh, you know, uh, policy and legal options that are, that are at the disposal um, of judges in, in trying to recognize uh, women's labor. So thank you, and uh, I'll, I will stop there. Thank you, Prabha. You've given us a lot to talk about, um, and we're going to let Eric be our first respondent. Um, in some detail. Great. Thank you so much. The paper was really fascinating. I learned a lot. And um, as Karen mentioned, there really is a quite a lot going on in the paper. I feel like I could talk all day about it. And I think that's a very good thing. Um, I tried to think about how to frame my comments. And I think the way I'm going to approach, you know, there's, again, there's so much I want to say, but I want to start with two, I'll, my comments will 
dovetail into or you know, separate into two different categories. One are sort of descriptive, that confront certain descriptive claims that are made, and only a few of them because they're quite a lot. And then I'll try to turn to normative issues. And you know, just by way of background, my own training is is in moral, political, and legal, legal philosophy. So those are naturally going to be the, you know, the kinds of issues that draw my attention. And I'll leave uh, to the social scientists, you know, the descriptive social scientists, the you know, the rest, the, the task of, of, of looking at a closer, taking a closer look at more of the descriptive claims. But there are three, I guess, descriptive claims that really caught my attention. Uh, one was that there's sort of an increasing recognition of unpaid domestic care work um, in, in, in courts in India, and especially at the intermediate appellate courts, but also the higher courts. And this just was, was fascinating to see. Um, and um, um, leaving aside how we characterize that normatively as a good or bad thing, they're, you've definitely persuaded me um, that this is, this is, there's some momentum going, um, albeit in fits and starts, towards greater recognition of unpaid domestic care work. Um, the second issue is, th the second descriptive claim is the idea that this is um, sort of falling under the umbrella of tort law. And I'll have to confess that this descriptive claim seemed a little less persuasive to me, and maybe it's due to my theoretical priors. But when we're at the point when most of these claims are, are occurring under the Motor Vehicles Act, or in the context of, um, you know, of insur where insurance is doing the lion's share of the litigation, um, especially in the motor vehicles context. Um, there's a very strong argument to be made that we're no longer really truly in the realm of tort law, that this is really contracts, and in particular, this subset of contracts, called insurance contracts. And um, these are, you know, of course, if the US is any indication, I'm sure it's the same in India, these are heavily regulated industry, the, the industry of insurance contracts. Now, why is this important? Well, this is important because, at least in the US, the con sort of the dominant perspective uh, and the dominant theoretical approach to redistributive policy sees private law is, is not involved in any sort of redistributive policy. That is, it's really about um, some sort of interaction between um, individuals in an individual relationship. If you want to do redistribution at, at sort of a social level, from the haves to the have less, then you do it through a tax and transfer system, primarily. Um, and there are all sorts of standard neoliberal arguments for this. I'd be curious to what your thoughts are about this. And at first I thought, well, this is sort of, I would like to hear your thoughts. What is the pushback against this? My initial comments to you were of that vein. Why should we look at tort law? as sort of the mechanism by which we do this redistribution, right? But then I realized, wait a minute, this in some sense is really, we're not really talking about tort law. We really are talking about a system of social insurance as, as you know, one of the cases that you cited alluded to. And the way it's effectuated is sort of as a sort of ex post tax. And when you look at it that way, well, you know, um, tort law kind of goes aside and we're just straight up talking about, should we force people to buy insurance uh, in the motor vehicle context to effectuate some sort of redistribution. And there, I think the argument, you know, there's an argument to be made, less, less so when you're talking about tort law. But maybe that topic, you know, that's maybe more a labeling issue, but labeling matters when we talk about, when we get to the normative issues. Um, the, the third, the, the, the kind of the issue that by now you already know really captured my attention was um, the characterization of this move as involving a feminist outcome or um, being sort of a fem and by this move, I mean the, the move towards unpaid, greater recognition of unpaid domestic care work as sort of an essentially feminist outcome, or at least, and you notice that at least there are feminist economists being cited in these cases, and there's some rhetoric that, that seems quite plausibly to count as feminist. But um, you've already recognized this in your, in your talk and in your paper, so I don't want to belabor the point. But I do want to put on the table Kate Mann's work on, on misogyny and to, and to suggest that not only, at least some of these cases seem not only to be consistent with misogyny, but quite arguably are expressions of misogyny. And to make that argument, or at least to put it on the table, I want to just 
remind everybody what Kate Mann says about misogyny. So she sees misogyny as an expression or sort of the, the law enforcement arm of sexism or, or sort of a patriarchal culture. And the important thing to notice is that although primarily the way that um, men and either uh, other women too enforce patriarchal culture is through social punishment, sometimes legal punishment, but also not just sticks, but carrots, right? Praising women who, um, you know, perform their assigned social roles and do so without complaint and pliably and dutifully. And with that framework in mind, it was just, and I have to just repeat this, I think this was on one of your slides, but this is from the, the, the Chanchal Kutri case, I think. But this language is so, so striking to me. One must remember that in Indian society, a mother must not only serves her children, but she is also a teacher, guide, mentor, philosopher for them. She inculcates good habits for her children. And the opinion continues. These are moral values which can be taught by a mother only and no one else. Really striking. And then the, the, the opinion goes on and, and emphasizes that a mother works with selfless devotion, right? So I, you know, I understand the point that there's sort of strategic value in, in, in relying on um, you know, this altruistic model of, of, of motherhood in order to gain uh, certain um, you know, um, either distributional effects or, or symbolic recognition of the mother's role. But I just, it, and you again, you've recognized the, the risks that come with that kind of st strategy, but I just wanted to just emphasize it so um, uh, we can maybe talk about it a little more and, and, and I'd be curious about what your thoughts about how high the risk is, right? So that was the third descriptive point is, can we really characterize this movement as, um, as a feminist movement when so much of it seems to be consistent with outright misogyny, right? Uh, at least in Kate Mann's sense of the word. And then um, normative issues. And I, I won't spend, all, I've already I think I've spent a lot of time talking, but the normative issues um, were truly fascinating to me. And in particular, um, what I take to be um, Karen Pass's um, um, egalitarian analysis. So again, as I mentioned, normatively, you know, even if we grant that th this, um, movement towards the greater recognition of unpaid domestic care work is a movement within tort law. Let's grant that for the, for the moment. Um, at the outset, I just kind of re reiterate my question. So why is tort law a good vehicle for this redistribution as opposed to normatively good, as opposed to using just an ordinary tax and transfer model? And this, for what it's worth, I'm very sympathetic to using tort law for redistributive aims. I'm, I'm not um, a law and econ scholar who thinks that that's just nonsense, but I'd be curious if you, if there's a stock response that you have, I'd be curious to steal that response from you basically. Um, and then the second normative question is about Karen Pass's model, which I wasn't familiar with. So it, it's presented as an egalitarian approach as sort of um, but I really struggled to see how you, you could evaluate any social outcome using this framework. And what was, so it's not a formal form of equality because that's a very, it's not a very good kind of equality. It's the equality that says anybody who can pay whatever they want to attorneys are equal, even though some people can't pay anything for attorneys, right? So it's not formal equality. But then we get to the point where, it's not even a prioritarian conception of equality where we pay attention to the needs of the least well off in order to elevate them up. Um, and it, presumably there's some kind of symbolic equality here. You know, do you express the right kind of attitude towards people? Do you, do you, for example, treat everybody with equal concern or respect? That's presumably an egalitarian factor. But once all is said and done, you have all of these different conceptions of equality and we're told that we just have to use the combined weight of all the factors that should lead to an overall evaluation of the rule. And you see where I'm going, right? Which is, I just don't know how we come to this conclusion about whether social politics is pro-egalitarian or not. Um, and indeed, you know, once we weigh up all the factors, 
if I have Kate Mann in my back pocket and I look at, you know, a large swath of these appellate cases seem to be expressions of misogyny, do I say, my net judgment is now that these cases are anti-egalitarian, anti right? Um, so this is just a, a plea for clar clarification. And one final point normatively. So I think I, I, your presentation was very helpful for me in understanding a little more about distributive analysis, and I de definitely want to learn more. It seems more of a descriptive disposition approach as opposed to a, a necessarily a normative one. You've got to detach yourself from um, sort of our priors about discriminatory behavior and how it's bad and, and do just the whole cold you know, calculation about who gets what from where, when, and how much. Or, and that, there's something very attractive about that. But I just, at this point, would like to invite you to say a little bit more about um, how that approach differs from Karen Pass's egalitarian approach and whether we're supposed to take it, draw any normative lessons. Like, do you reject Karen Pass's um, rejection of the lexical priority of the material? And it sounds like it. It sounds like we're supposed to prioritize the material in our assessments. But, you know, that was, that's all I have. Um, again, this was super exciting to read and I learned a lot and I can't wait to, to see how this project develops. Wonderful. Great. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Um, I think everyone should turn on their cameras now, um, who feels like it, uh, and certainly the students should. Um, I think we'll give uh, Prabha a few minutes to respond to Eric, um, just, but I think that a lot of the issues that um, Eric raised will be ones that folks want to talk about more generally. So we can, you don't have to cover everything. We can keep going with other people chiming in too. Wonderful. Thanks, Karen. And thanks, Eric. Those are such absolutely brilliantly useful comments. Thank you. Thank you for pushing me. So I think I, I will be selective and I will be brief. Um, so I think the question, I'm, first of all, I'm glad that I convinced you of the momentum of the Indian courts because I think it, it is there, uh, uh, you know, through just reiteration of the Agarwal case. Um, now, the, the question around tort law is a fantastic question, actually, is this more you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, they, they talk about, uh, you know, the courts do talk about this as a social insurance mechanism, you know, often state sponsored. And actually in the 2019 amendment, there is talk of a fund to be set up by the state, which will, you know, uh, subsidize or pay for compensation for hit and run cases and so on. Um, but I think the, the question, the more pointed question you had around the fact that this is you know, private law, it's a private law mechanism, why get uh, into this messy work of redistribution? Um, I think I just want to channel Karen Pass who says that, you know, redistribution is not just of material gains for which, of course, you could say, you know, use, um, you know, tax and transfer, but that it plays an important role in redistributing intangible resources such as dignity and, uh, you know, respect and recognition and so on. So I think he argues that tort law can play a pretty important role there. I guess my own response would be that of a legal realist, which is simply to say that there is nothing uh, quite so clear as you know the divide between public and private law. That in fact, you know, private law really is uh, uh, again you know following Morris Cohen and you know all the legal realists to really say that you know it's an arm of you know uh, public law. You know to the extent that the state backstops private actors and uses the police powers of the state and enforcing or not enforcing certain rules, it's playing a very important role. And therefore really private law is an, is an arm of, of, uh, of public law, it's a form of public law. So, you know, I see those uh, divisions in a very, in a very blurred fashion. Uh, and I think this is, and I think in the Indian context, actually we've gone too far. So there is also the context of India, which is, uh, as I say in my paper that, um, you know, there are tort law scholars who are very, uh, infuriated that in fact, you know, the courts have in their uh, commitment to constitutional law, you know, made tort law public law as it is, you know, in the sense that there are some fundamental principles of tort law around causation um, and vicarious liability that actually courts have given short shrift to. So actually, all the more in the Indian context, one can't tell the difference between public and private law. There is, there is a danger there to the development of private law, but 
that's that's what the context is in which we talk about. So this issue is not as germane for us um, as it might be in other contexts. Um, and I think the question around uh, distributional analysis. So Karen Paz, you know, is someone uh, who I uh, so he calls his analysis egalitarian analysis. I see it as being very close to the kind of distributional analysis that the legal realists want and the, the kind of work that Janet has also espoused. And this is more from reading his example. So he's very agnostic. I think much like Janet, I think in performing this distributional analysis, you know, suspend judgment, um, you know, step back. I, I think it doesn't disavow uh, having a normative position, but at least for a brief period requires that you suspend any deep attachments to particular outcomes. And he does the same thing. So he's very agnostic. But actually, when you look at particular examples, and there are many of them in his book, many of them are feminist examples, actually. So he's very deeply conscious of the power differentials, the differential bargaining power between the various actors. So, for example, he gives the exam, uh, talks about, you know, couple that uh, use IVF uh, and they have frozen eggs, embryos, and then they get separated. So the question is, should the wife be allowed to enforce her right to have a baby through those embryos? You know, he asks these very important questions and then produces a rather feminist analysis. So although he seems agnostic, actually, he has a deeply feminist sensibility. So I think it's more, um, so I see them as, I see very much as a form of distributional analysis, um, but also committed uh, to core uh, sort of feminist uh, normative uh, ideals. I think I'll, I'll uh, I think I'll stop there. All right, I suppose, this is funny because everybody can see, ah, okay, so a student in the class, Vani Devani, Devani um, who also wrote a paper, why don't you start? Hi, yeah, so I think that you actually addressed this question in part. Um, so thank you so much for, for recognizing that question. But I still am struggling with the concept. And I think that um, your work that we read, it was very clear to see the correlation between the value that society places on life and how that influences damages. Um, however, I'm still struggling to see how tort law reform could potentially influence social values. Um, and I think that this has just been a hot topic um, in the US with um, Breonna Taylor, who has just granted $12 million. Um, and I try to think of it in that frame light and think how could that damages when life is already over, when the wrong has already happened, how could that influence our societal values when I feel like it's something that isn't necessarily even public all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's very difficult to um, obviously, you know, uh, I mean, the 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 Brianna Taylor compensation amount seems, you know, quite, I mean, I don't know where it falls in the sort of trajectory of compensation levels, but my understanding is that, you know, for a, for a very long time, I think, you know, both women and people of color have been, you know, compensation levels have been, you know. Uh, to discriminatory uh, valuations in the in the labor market, so um, I think you know it's it's so it's interesting to hear that uh, you know the, the damages she was awarded uh, was was uh, you know I, I think substantially higher than anything that the the gender tables or the race tables um, under tort law um, uh, in the U.S. would have allowed for. So I think that seems like a really uh, welcome move. Um, but I think, I mean, I think in the context of India where, you know, the levels of uh, marriage are so high, um, you know, anywhere between 94 to 98% and, um, you know, the marital economy simply, uh, you know, appropriates so much of women's labor, I think any kind of uh, recognition, even if it's, you know, uh, really minuscule, and often it was minuscule, and I think this goes to uh, kind of Eric's point, actually, that, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, the uh, what I mean by the feminist outcome is simply on a case-by-case -case basis, what would happen, you know, there would be a very small amount um, awarded by the tribunal, and then the high court would actually increase it, um, you know, but even if they increased it a couple of times over, it was never really adequate to um, you know, it, it never seemed substantial enough, 
uh, you know, I think instead the rhetoric uh, was outsized the actual, uh, you know, monetary compensation. And I think the courts acknowledged themselves as well that they could never really do uh, justice uh, to the, you know, to the labor of the women. Uh, but I still think that there is some, there is some value, the very fact that, you know, um, there's such high levels of abjection in marriage amongst Indian women, the fact that there is any recognition of the work that they do, um, I think, you know, uh, has symbolic value. Um, Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. I guess I was also curious um, if you feel like the COVID-19 pandemic and women's um, increased responsibilities at home, whether stay-at-home workers or, um, I mean, stay-at-home mothers or um, working mothers, if you feel like that will either have a direct difference on monetary tort damages or per, perhaps even just an influence on society views of the value of women and mothers specifically. Sure. I think the, the tort law, you know, although I choose tort law, it's not really, you know, I don't think of it as being the primary way of, you know, uh, furthering this debate for feminists. Actually, I think that you have to extract it outside of tort law to see you know, how else, so certainly in the context that, you know, I'm working in, in the Indian context, I, I've tried to use this jurisprudence to think about how surrogacy, for example, could be compensated rather than be treated uh, as, uh, you know, the state has been insisting that it be an altruistic form of labor. Uh, but I think the, the situation of the pandemic, I think that's a very valuable point. I think it brings us back full circle to some of the debates that feminists have been having for a very long time around, um, you know, uh, should we sort of valorize reproductive labor or uh, is it so hard to separate our reproductive labor from productive labor? Both men and women are participating in it, um, you know, especially if you're working from home, you know, how do you draw boundaries? You know, all of these issues have come up and already you're beginning to see debates around should we have a, you know, shorter working week? Uh, you know, should people work only for four, hour, four days a week? You know, would this actually save businesses? So I think it's a very interesting way in which some of these Feminist and social reproduction are uh, coming uh, full circle. I think so. It's a it's a very um, interesting point at which to intervene for us because we've been thinking about it for uh, you know for such a long time. But of course, it, it's also a function of what happens within the economy because I think a lot of women will be losing jobs as will men, and then you know to the extent that you know a lot of this reproductive labor has been outsourced, you know whether in the West through migrant labor or you know, even in the Indian context, uh, through quite relatively inexpensive, uh, you know, local domestic migrants, I think there is a sense that demand for such services might actually also fall. So I think there's a very, there's a, there's a real role here for the distribution and analysis and to think about the economic effects of, you know, this sudden shock uh, to see what would actually happen to particular sectors of reproductive labor. Okay, we've got a number of other questions in now, um, and we have one from Alyssa Gordon, who is a student in our class. Um, and Alyssa, just jump in if you'd like to read it out, but otherwise I'll go ahead. Um, in your opinion, what are your views on loss of consortium and how it relates to UDCW? And do you have any ideas of productive ways to better quantify UDCW? Okay. So, yeah, I think, you know, the, the so the relationship uh, between loss of consortium and unpaid work, I think I've outlined in the paper. So the loss of consortium clearly has some, uh, uh, has a very problematic history. And in a certain sense, actually, um, I'm glad that the Indian courts, uh, you know, disaggregated the unpaid work from the loss of consortium and placed it under the pecuniary category, where in fact it could be uh, multiplied. And, um, you know, and what would be any of the productive ways? I think that's actually quite uh, hard to do, uh, you know, for all sorts of reasons, because we are actually, so, you know, compared to the sort of distributional analysis, uh, and I want to say a little bit here about distribution analysis, because it's one of the questions that one of the reaction papers from the students spoke about is, you know, what is the value of distributional analysis? Does it really give us this kind of normative edge? Does it give us any direction in deciding? And I think it really depends on the context. So I think, you know, in the work on, on sex work, for example, it was much easier to pass out in some ways the political economy of sex work to see you know, where all the distribution of consequences landed um, because you could limit the frame somehow to who the stakeholders would be. 
But I think in the context of domestic work, it's much, much harder because you're really talking about, you know, 300 million women at any given point who are, you know, radically kind of, you know, differentiated in all sorts of ways. So I think the possibly the best way to do it is not necessarily through a gender neutral mechanism such as UBI, but something that is, um, you know, aimed at women themselves, you know, a, an unconditional recognition of all women's reproductive labor. Uh, you know, and it would be interesting to see what the distributional effects of a move like that might be. Um, so that's, that's what I would uh, sort of like to use this jurisprudence to think about. All right. Um, why don't we now go to Indrani Chatterjee, who has an RTS and a question um, in the chat, which I can't tell if it's responding to someone else. So I'll let you articulate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prabha, that was uh, wonderful. And as a historian of, um, you know, the period before you start your work, I absolutely endorse uh, the point that you made, which is that the line between private and public is extremely blurred and that the great household is in fact an employer of the smaller household on the women of the smaller household. So in fact, tort law or private law is the only place where the great household, that is the employer of domestic uh, workers, uh, women workers, can in fact be held accountable. So I'm in fact wondering, uh, what are the developments in that area of uh, law, uh, especially since I'm certain that insurance companies are not covering or the bigger households are not in fact um, being covered by insurance contracts though they are using the police to verify the identities of the various maids that are coming into their colonies to work and such like so that's one question and following from that i wanted to ask entirely because i'm so um uh, I'm so baffled by uh, the causes of the, the, the judicial activism mm -hmm. on the part of the judges who otherwise would, you know, in my old fashioned sort of class caste analysis would perhaps line up with the employing households rather than on the side of the employed households. So uh, I wanted to in fact ask about uh, how you explain this judicial activism mm -hmm. through tort law. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we can go into the next set of um, the, the social distribution according to caste and caste politics and political organization that is happening outside of the courts, right? Um, so those are really three big questions I'm asking in one. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. And Rani, I just want to clarify. So the first question is you're talking about paid domestic work. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. And to see, you know, where the, the movement is. Actually, you know, uh, so for for a long time, I thought that the, the case for, you know, labor law protection for paid domestic work is quite straightforward uh, in the sense that, you know, there's an employer, there's an employee, you know, it's a question of contract law, and then there should just be, you know, bargaining power for the domestic workers. But actually, it's, it's quite fascinating. In the context after COVID, there have been just so innumerable webinars with domestic workers. So initially, the webinars didn't have any domestic workers, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and more recently, some of the organizations actually talk, you know, have domestic workers themselves talking about their plight. And more and more listening to them, um, their claim is not towards the employer. They are not making claims to the employer. They're making claims of the state. Hmm. Uh, and I actually think that in some ways, the struggle for recognizing paid domestic work is far behind where we think it is actually. So I don't think paid domestic workers have reached that sort of uh, status of workers. You know, mm. I still think, I think the, the idea of the cultures of servitude that, you know, people like Rakari have written about are very resonant even today. Um, and the fact that, you know, and there's been, and this, this information is coming from different places where even, you know, people who have been studying trade union models uh, find that in fact when they interview domestic workers 
and you know ask about which union they are part of because there are many domestic workers unions in india today they often can't remember the name of the union they only remember the person who comes and visits them so i just think that you know in fact and if you and so i've been looking at some of the cases around paid domestic work and quite interestingly the majority of the cases that show up in the judicial databases are all of criminal law they're all criminal law cases where domestic workers have been raped by their employers mm. and then they come to the rape trial and they turn hostile so i i just feel that the, the prognosis is not good for recognition of paid domestic workers rights we are very very far from so although i know that the labor movement and the women's movement uh, thinks of this as a clear cut case where oh let's have there are lots of specific like legislative proposals for recognizing paid domestic work actually if you look at the social movement i think we are really quite far behind so i do and i think this thing verification by the police and the resident welfare associations is part of that mechanism of social norms is being a structuring the the labor market uh, where the state i really think will have uh, a limited role to play through labor law you know they could do it through you know uh, social security schemes that kind of relationship with what reena agarwala calls you know social movement unionism mm. that seems much more plausible to me than the more conventional sort of labor law model um the question around judicial activism i have yeah i think that's a really fantastic question and i've been actually thinking of uh, you know getting into it's an empirical question and i i'm not really sure but i i'm just really amazed by how many judges you know all the sort of important supreme court judges you know madan loko geeta you know all the yeah. all of them are so invested in this particular issue they've all had a string of judgments on this issue i'm very curious to see how that has emerged certainly historically it seems in the 60s and 70s it was very much a sort of post colonial you know it was a moment of breaking away from english common law to say you know we can do this better than you um and very much you know like i said uh channeling constitutional values uh but what happened in the late 90 i mean but you do see a shift the uh, the invocation of you know liberal feminist ideas about you know uh, workforce participation that you know not compensating women is affecting their paid work so yeah. there is a different strand of feminist thinking that the judges are channeling and it would be it would be some so there is definitely a shift even in the the kind of rhetoric um and i don't know whether what eric mentioned you know about the the nation builders right whether that's more a post 2014 turn with the the rise of the bjp um so it'll be something that i need to look at but i think the question on caste is fascinating because in fact none of the cases talk about caste so there are signifiers yeah it's 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 scandalous as always um and you know so there's there's you know class seems to be the one kind of way of trying to diagnose caste somewhere there but no direct references um i have a two on your earlier one indrani oh okay um <laughs> can i in fact we now have a bunch of questions okay. um i will hold it okay but but i but i if you don't i really wanted to follow up on the class um and cast as well because you say early on in the piece that you want to look and you you do say how housewives are differentiated or not differentiated and that and how feminists need to do that which is something you're so good at in your work and i was kind of there were a couple points in the paper that i thought you had such a good opportunity to say more about casting class um and 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 i'll just give two examples so one is the whole do you see the woman so so it seems like the the critique of class 6 was about was a feminist critique about whether it's one third or one half of the household um that you value the woman's um unpaid work at and that seems to me to totally avoid a, what must be a big issue right i mean it means that if you're pegging it and i think you almost suggested at some point i thought you were going to go there if you peg it to the husband's salary then you're saying that housework in some families is worth and care work is worth a lot less than in other families um and i wondered if there was a critique of that And the second place I saw it, I didn't see it when I first read it. So I saw it in your presentation today um when you put the quotation up from oh no and now I moved it. 
um, the quotation that said, um, only a mother can do this work. And so I think that this was, a, a, this is how I was hearing Andrani's question at the beginning. I, I wanted to ask not what's actually happening. Well, I, did, I guess I did want to ask in part, what, what are the possibilities that this jurisprudence could have an impact on the way in which we value paid domestic work? Which is sort of what you were answering, which is why I put it in here as a two. But I thought there were some ways in which it might not help paid domestic work because somehow the paid domestic workers now are not giving care, right? Only mothers can do that. Um, and, you know, that's just one case. So I don't know. But, you know, the flip side of it is you could say, well, but at least they're valuing this work. So then if you can show that people are paid to do it, should we get paid a lot more to do it, then maybe it would be beneficial. And I don't know if there are others on that point too, or if that was where your next question was, Andrani, but if not, there are a bunch of ones on the table. I'll, I'll defer to all the ones. <laughs> I think the, the, those are fantastic observations, Karen. I think I need to work on it some more. I think certainly, yes, the class six, uh, thing I think I, I I refer to Gita Mittal's critique of clause of that clause in class terms because she she points out that you know a, a wealthy woman can't necessarily she can't be paid more than a woman who's not wealthy right because of clause six and then says well therefore she, you would have to show in the case of an upper class housewife that she's actually providing any services so it would have to be adduced in court so I think yeah that is definitely something that you know. Um, I, she picks up on and I, I uh, completely, you know, agree with that. Um, the question around paid domestic work, actually, I think it's quite, quite important because there's a way in which um, the courts, so yeah, I need to tease out that relationship between unpaid and uh, uh, paid domestic work some more because of course, you know, it, there is a class bias and, you know, manual work, uh, you know, in the caste system is always devalued um, and I need to definitely talk more about that and um, I, I will do that uh, but what is interesting is that a lot of the housewives also did pay domestic work yeah. and sometimes the companies would say well they are incapable of doing you know unpaid work at home because they're actually working outside the home and I think this is one of the questions that a student asked as well in the reaction paper whether this compromises the rights of working women and the court actually the courts have said uh, you know, just because a woman works outside the home doesn't mean, you know, doesn't mean she's doing less within the home. So I think they, they ticked off that box, but I think uh, there's, there's much more to be said about uh, how we don't necessarily value manual work um, as much. Um, yeah. So I've got a question here from Rinda Marwa, but I don't know if some of this was actually covered in, in the answer that you just gave, um, Professor Koteswaran. Um, Rinda, do you still want to go ahead and ask something or develop that a little bit? Uh, I'm not sure if she can hear me, but um, no, it's as it is. Okay. Um, all right, let me read it out. Um, so she says, um, you've shown how generative, generative it is to consider an understudied site like motor vehicle accidents rather than the more usual divorce settlements. I was wondering if you've come across judgments in accidental deaths of working mothers and if the emphasis on love, affection, socialization of children, et cetera, is as strong when women had a full-time job. Yeah, I think that's partly what I was just talking about, the fact that, you know, it, it being, uh, having a full-time job was not necessarily a reason for devaluing, uh, you know, the care work uh, that the women did. Um, so I don't know if that answers Vrinda's question, but I'm happy to. I think, uh, let's see what she says. It does. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so then we have one from Upasana Garnik. Do you, should I read, I'll read it out and you can chime in. Um, thank you so much, this was so great. UDCW, she's got it down. <laughs> and death reminds me of Jay Singh's article, Concern for the Death. Condemnation for the 
Living, where she discusses how dowry deaths are treated differently from dowry demand and cruelty cases when the mm. woman is alive. I was curious to know if there are any scenarios that may have come across other than MBA where her UDCW is recognized for her own claims when she is alive. Um, other than is recognized for it. Well, no, I haven't, only because I haven't looked, but that's my, that's my next project is to actually, you know, to do something like what Catherine Silver did, I think, uh, in the US context, to really look at other areas of, of Indian law. Uh, and I've started with tort law, but, you know, I'm, this is very useful, this pointer to, you know, Jay Singh's article, which I will definitely, I'm assuming that's Indra Jay Singh, and uh, I'll definitely um, look at it. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I think it, it's going to be much harder to look at family law, but that's my next site for investigation. Um, and uh, there have been proposals to recognize, uh, you know, community property in the Indian context, but I want to sort of see how that relates to questions around personal law and, uh, you know, matrimonial uh, law reform. Um, we did have a request to speak from Neville. Neville? Hello, can you hear me? Am I, am I unmuted? Yes. I just want to thank you very much. That was a really wonderful, fascinating talk, and I learned a lot from it. I am not a lawyer, and I'm not remotely a South Asianist either. Uh, I'm an English professor with a slightly morbid sensitivity to metaphors, analogies, sort of rhetorical slights of hand. And there was something on the, the first slide that you showed. And I, I mean, I admire in many ways Sylvia, Sylvia Federici, though recently she's become a bit more of a problematic figure for me. And I'm interested in what are the, <clears throat> in this wider project, we're talking a lot about racial capitalism. And I'm interested in what are the metaphors that people use to register un, unpaid labor? and how there always seems to be some conscious or not element of racial insult in it. And so the sentence that struck out in that Federici quote that you had on the slide was the kitchen is our slave ship. And then there was that strange quote from March PSC that I can't quite remember. There was something like grand Am Cooley or I mean, it, it was, I just found so the, the combination of those two things made me wonder like how, I mean, and we're very far from um, your cases, but I'm just wondering how those racialized and gendered, and actually to me, and also in, this, in the second one, kind of colonial unconsciousness impact the way that one can understand unpaid labor or whether uh, the, the suffering or the lack or just 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 what what can you tell me something about the racial figurines of unpaid labor you know, in these you know in these feminist economists and does it actually move into the jurisprudence at all yeah that's such a wonderful question and you know i did um i have to say that i uh, was trying to just you know, find a quote from Federici's Revolution at Point Zero and, uh, you know, found this. And I was trying to just sort of, I think it goes to what Eric has helpfully pointed out. It's the sort of the elephant in the room, which is, you know, if this is so misogynistic, you know, uh, this valuation of, of housework, then, uh, you know, how, how should we think of it? And I wanted to counterpose, uh, you know, Federici's, uh, you know, idea from wages from the wages from uh, for housework campaign that actually you price housework in order to reject it. So you know, I was really focused on the rejection of housework that came through um, that quote, and you know, the fact that she said that some of the original proponents of wages for housework uh, of the campaign were actually welfare mothers uh, in the U.S who told the state that they would rather get paid for taking care of their own children uh, than be paid to take care of other 
people's children. So, and I think, you know, given also all the sort of anti-colonial, um, I mean, she, she refers certainly in revolution at point zero, um, uh, very much to, you know, the anti-colonial movement um, and to, you know, uh, the, 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 the struggles of, um, of African American women. So I thought, you know, it sort of resonated, but I, um, but it is, so in, certainly in the Indian context, it's, um, it, it would appear through the lens of, of caste uh, and, you know, it, it sort of appears and disappears and the, the, some of the feminists, so there are two strands of uh, feminist literature in the Indian context that deal with unpaid work. It's the fe feminist economists uh, who are very focused in this very clinical way on time use surveys to really, uh, you know, document as exhaustively as possible the kind of work that, uh, you know, women do. Uh, and it's not clear from those works how much, I mean, I'm sure caste is something that they, uh, you know, put down in their question is, but how they analyze it is not, is not particularly clear. And then there are, um, you know, more sort of NGOs and grassroots level organizations that talk about, you know, uh, health workers at the lowest level, you know, ASHA workers, public health workers, you know, work, women who work in the creches who are highly likely to be, of, you know, uh, from sort of the weaker caste and, uh, you know, uh, economically disadvantaged sections of society. But I think, I think more could be said about caste uh, and it's not something that, and it's, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a problem uh, of the Indian feminist movement and for the Indian feminist movement. So, um, uh, but I, I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm still working my way through the racial capitalism literature. And I think the, some of the, you know, like for example, the work of Alice Weinbaum on, uh, you know, the afterlives of, of slavery, the reproductive afterlives of slavery, as she calls it, you know, are, are quite compelling where she talks about how Indian surrogates, for example, you know, we shouldn't keep apart, say, surrogacy and slavery, we shouldn't keep them apart as much as we uh, might be inclined to do, because in fact, you know, unless you understand slavery, you can't really understand commodification, um, you know, so it's something that I'm working through, and I thank you for, you know, provoking me to think more about it. All right, I think next is a, class, is a question from Megan Leahy, who's in the class. Um, she says, since it seems like recognizing domestic work as work steps on the shoulders of sex work, at least according to the courts, to lift it up, how do you think this move in tort law might affect the movement to recognize sex work as work? Um, steps on the shoulders of sex work, okay. Um, I think, yeah, I think this is a terrific question, actually. And it's something that, so although I'm looking at housewives and tort law, obviously this has ramifications for, um, you know, women and sort of all the satellite institutions, really. And I think we need sort of a theory of marriage because marriage seems to be so central in the Indian social context, uh, the relationship between marriage and these other sexual economies. And I think you could think of it in a couple of different ways. And, uh, one is in terms of um, sort of the overlap between these institutions. So often, you know, the, the housewife who's also the sex worker, uh, the sex worker who's also, you know, the housewife. So the brothel is also a household, you know, where children are born and they're raised um, and so on. Um, or one could think about this relationship in terms of a continuum, uh, which is, you know, uh, there are unmarried women uh, who become uh, who are married and then who are divorced and separated. And, Often, you know, uh, a very high percentage of sex workers are previously married, who are divorced, or separated. So I think, for example, uh, if tort law, if this recognition of unpaid work could in fact, uh, you know, improve the economic bargaining power of women and allow them to exit marriage on their own terms, I think it would have, you know, it would have ramifications for how, on what terms they enter or do not enter you know, sex work. I think it's the same for commercial surrogacy to the extent that you recognize the reproductive labor of women there based on say, this tort law jurisprudence, um, they may be more empowered to actually exit marriage. So I think uh, there's a deep connection between marriage and all these um, other economies. Uh, and I think the third way also of thinking of it is in terms of bargains. And I think this might be what you're alluding to, which is often the, the, you know, the rights of sex workers would be counterposed vis-a-vis -vis the rights of housewives, you know, so it's a zero-sum game. Uh, 
uh, when in fact, you know, feminists would not want to see it that way. And so I would really push back against um, uh, something like that. Uh, but does it in fact help recognize sex work? I, I don't think so. Um, I think one might be able to make a case in relation to say biological reproduction and even there it's very difficult, say in the context of commercial surrogacy. But I think sex work has always been that sort of outside category of, um, you know, where, uh, you know, courts would be very wary to recognize it um, as a form of work. Um, okay, so our next question is from Stuart, who is also another student in the class, um, who says, one very attenuated concern in distributional analysis might be the role of tort attorneys in this process. Do low income households have access to attorneys? Can low income families wait until the end of litigation for the prospective benefit to be paid? Should we rely on the tort system when there could be there could exist a public benefits tax and transfer system to perform the same work? It's fantastic. That's a great question. Uh, um, so yeah, I mean, they, they are supposed to, you know, low income households are on the, on the face of it, there are legal services authorities, you know, at the district level, at the state level in India, but, you know, how they function is, you know, anyone's guess, really. It's very unlikely that they're really, uh, you know, helping uh, these, these claimants in any real way. Uh, but that said, because so many of these cases have really congested the civil law system, you know, there had been uh, these kind of alternate dispute resolution mechanisms such as the local dalits or people's courts where a retired judge would simply you know bring both parties together and you know is informally settled and that has often been a more expeditious way of actually dealing with uh, the claims of some of these uh, these groups and in terms of you know the public benefits tax it's something that i need to investigate i'm not entirely sure uh, how that could happen um, but it's certainly uh, a, a very appealing idea. And, and I think one could also work around all the other sort of background legal rules here. You know, there's been litigation around uh, not allowing alcohol shops near, you know, at, from a certain distance from the highways, for example, because I think there's a lot to be done in terms of road safety. And, you know, some of those sort of larger infrastructural areas could also be worked on to actually uh, reduce the high levels of mortality from, uh, from you know these road accidents. All right, I was we were going to hear from Indrani, but she just left. And I should tell you, there are many, many um, notes in here about how awesome the paper is. Um, you know, maybe I'll just um, and we're almost out of time, so this is uh, this is great. Um, Maybe I just comment on one of the things that I think is really useful and not thought enough about in the paper. Um, and, and Eric's question about whether this is a feminist outcome, obviously, I mean, it got to that, but, I, but in a couple of ways, because I think, you know, one is, is the representation feminist, and then the other is, is the outcome, right, from the consequentialist standpoint, mm -hmm. um, is it feminist? And, but I think that in, in distributional analysis, we, we don't, we haven't really figured out what we think about symbolic effects um, and what counts as a symbolic effect and what kind of material consequences, if any, symbolic effects have to have. Um, and it sounds like in some ways, I mean, you know, I, it seems like when you started writing this paper, there was legislation that was being considered and then the legislation was decided. And so now it's not really an issue anymore because they just came up with a lump sum, um, which actually deals with some of the class issues, um, but also makes it much cheaper for the insurance companies, I'm sure. Um, but probably also means that some people are getting awards without having to litigate to go to Stuart's question, if I'm understanding that right. So then you're kind of in a situation where you're not actually thinking about the private law, whether you call it tort or contract in this instance, um, to do the work as much as you're looking at the various realms in which it might be used. And so, I mean, I thought the earlier question about family law was really good on that point. 
Um, I mean, I'm with you that the line between public and private, mm -hmm. and as you know, is I'm, I'm with you in the realist. So that's not, and tax and transfer is fine if you can get it through, but there are other things, other ways we might catch if we, if we look broadly enough. But it, I, it's sort of the way I heard the talk today it was much more about that than the symbolic effects at the end of the day. So, um, although it's hard, right? Because again, it, sometimes you want to say the symbolic effects, sometimes you want to say the symbolism is good and sometimes you want to say it's problematic, mm -hmm. right? So it's good in the sense that it values the work, it's problematic in the way in which it talks about it and the quote Eric read was a good example. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I mean, that's kind of more of a comment than um, a question that I, I, I liked that it was making us, that it's making us think about it. And yeah. I think yeah. it's a great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think going to Eric's point that I think, you know, it's, uh, it is, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, this is, you could argue that, you know, uh, a lot of those blurbs that I incorporated were just examples of judicial misogyny, right? I mean, I totally agree. But of course, there are, I mean, and that was partly in there to, you know, to draw our attention to how problematic it was, while also, you know, symbolically, and materially, you know, um, uh, it, helping those particular litigants. Uh, but then there are, of course, other cases uh, where judges uh, don't don't use that kind of misogyny, have a different understanding of marriage and the fact that you can be companionate or a liberal feminist and want to channel every feminist economist that is, uh, that's written on this. So there is really a range and not, not all the judges uh, kind of, you know, think alike. But I don't, but I do think that uh, if one could use this jurisprudence to in fact begin to compensate women for their reproductive labor that uh, they can exit marriage um, on their terms and that's really what i'm aiming for you know this 94 to 98 percent is just atrocious really it just cannot be that you know all of these women uh, you know want to be married i think they're just being you know trafficked between sort of the the families they were born in and you know to to husbands so i think um, and to the extent that marriage then becomes less important because women get, you know, are getting paid for their, their reproductive labor, I think in the long run, uh, you know, there could be a counter to this misogyny, you know, in some very real terms. I mean, that's, that's really what I'm hoping for, um, you know, in, and how, how one channelizes, how one, chan, you know, uses this jurisprudence is, is the kind of tricky question um, in order to achieve that. Um, and at what cost? Because <laughs> there's definitely a cost to... Um... Well, maybe we, we'll end with the cost. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you saw the applause as people were exiting, um, but we have one here with the people who are still here. Mm -hmm. um, thank, you. thank you so much to Prabha and to Eric. Um, that was a really terrific discussion. And, and I want to say, I mean, it's, it's really special that you gave us the paper um, well, in progress too, so that we could have this kind of input. So yeah. people don't do that enough, and it's 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 a real honor. Um, so thank you all again, and have a good evening, everyone. Okay, great. Thanks.